The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. We're going to do a little talking about the reading, um, and then we'll play a couple of games, and then last hour will be your time for your team to be able to, um, to work on your projects. Unless, of course, you are playing Monopoly and you are probably still playing Monopoly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so today is kind of like the historical part of class, right? I mean, we 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 looked a little bit at some games that uh, some some board games, some card games that did back for you, but now we're looking at very specific times, largely 1900 to about 1950, uh, right up to World War II. Um, there were a couple of games that I could have brought out, things like you know that that, that you will also be familiar with, things like 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 Bongo, for instance. Uh, but those come a little bit later. Some of these games, uh, you know, the Scrabble, for instance, um, have predecessors that come from the time period that we're talk, uh, uh, talking about, but these versions that we're familiar now might be, uh, probably had some rules changes along the way. Uh, similarly, how many people play Mothello or Reverse C? Yep. So reverse C dates from the time that I'm talking about, 1900s, 1900s uh, to, it uh, might actually be slightly before 1900. But Othello comes much, much later, like the 70s. Um, and what, what Othello is, um, uh, uh, how, how, how many of you knew, knew this game as Othello? This is like quite interesting. Okay, so that's kind of like a um, trademarked uh, uh, version of the rule set, which basically specifies what the initial start position of the game is. Uh, that's, uh, I, I believe it was a Japanese uh, game designer who publicized, uh, who, who wrote up the, the rules, set up the tournament rules for it and, pub, and, pub, and pub, publicized the game as Othello. But a version of this reverse maybe not black and white, maybe different colors on each token existed way before that. And, um, and Uno comes much later, but in today's reading, you read a little bit about a game. I think I think it was in today's read, uh, read, reading about a game that was that Parker Brothers tried to publish. That was kind of like Uno, only it had five colors instead of four. So, um, <coughs> so that's the reason why I got it included today. It's not necessarily because it, it all these games came from uh, from from 1900, but a lot of them came from now. Uh, started around about that time. Um, it's also a piece of local history. Salem is really not that far away. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if the building still exists. So if anyone's been to Salem recently, yeah. Yeah, then do they have the Parker Brothers building there? It's, it's, it's huge, apparently. Oh, it was. I don't know. If it's still, I'm not actually sure. It's not like a tourist attraction or anything? <laughs> no, it's definitely not a tourist attraction. Okay, it's not like, like the wish I think it might be like repurposed. Like right. a lot of stuff now is um, a lot of Parker Brothers properties are now owned by Hasbro, which is also not that far away, over in Rhode Island. In fact, um, something if you look at all of these games and just you know they say Milton Bradley, they say they say Parker Brothers, but when you actually look at who currently owns the property, it's just Hasbro, um, because that's that's the uh, the two thousand pound gorilla that's kind of the end. Except, but except, but except Mattel, which is a toy, a toy manufacturer that game manufacturer. Obviously, it's not niche is close enough. Um, I've also got games like Pretty Wings. How many of you played this right now? I never played this. Someone's gonna show me how to play this, okay? Because I, 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 this is not part of my job. Uh, uh, Pit, which we talked about before, and Flinch, uh, kind of like collection games, uh, card, card collecting games, and. Um, Anyone remember why Rocket Brothers went into card games? Because you know, they were making board games. They were making things like ping pong before that. They were smaller, easy manufacture. Mm -hmm. you, you print a sheet of cards, you cut it into identical slices, you pack it in a tiny little box. You can put a lot of these on the store shelf, or in a truck, or on a boat, um, as opposed to big boxes of monopoly. Um, so, <coughs> I think that the takeaway from everything that we're going to discuss today 
it's really all about how marketing and sales concerns are going to affect game design. Um, if you read, you know, the, the sorry, there's a, a Phil, Phil Ori who wrote the book, uh, What It Was, Vice President of R&D at Parker Brothers, also apparently the best monopoly player. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, he's got access to first-hand material. He's also writing from a very biased point of view. He's, you know, he, he's, he, he's writing totally as a Parker Brothers, you know, writer. Um, and, um, and, you know, you can take, take, take everything that he says from the brain assault. I'm sure not everybody was as, um, uh, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the past was not quite as rose tinted as the, as the book makes it out to be. But when facts are stated, you know, I think you can, you can rely on them. Yeah. And he talks, I think it's a pretty good design diary, uh, a, a sort of design diary of how various games became the way that they, that, 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 that they, they were. Uh, one thing that he didn't go into a lot of detail was uh, Monopoly, because that kind of comes after this chapter. <coughs> Um, but there's a little bit of that that I want to talk about, um, and we brought, uh, and we mentioned it that, um, in, in in class that it used to be called Magnolia's game. Um, this was patented uh, pro uh, product, and the name of the original designer was uh, Elizabeth McGee. Um, somewhere right at the beginning of the 1900s, um, although it took about three years between the patent and actual publishing to actually figure out all the manufacturing processes. Parker Bro Brothers only came um, uh, into ownership of this uh, product around about, let me see, let me see my notes here, 1934, so it took about 30 years. Um, and, the or and the original feedback from, from, from George Parker himself was, uh, the game is rejected because it's too complicated, too technical, and takes too long to play. Um, so they didn't actually um, buy Monopoly from the then license holder Charles Darrow uh, when it was offered to them. They bought it the following year after Christmas when they saw how well Charles Darrow's version was selling. Um, and in fact, uh, George Parker then invents Quick Rules um, and I believe um, actually imposes a time limit rule, which may not exist anymore. But everything that we talked about the problems of Monopoly you know, was something that George Parker and the Parker Brothers were very, very much aware of. They knew that there was a problem with this game. Um, but they also realized, you know, how it tapped into the zeitgeist. And then there, there, there was an opportunity there that could be capitalized. It was one that fit very well with their strengths as a, uh, as, as, uh, as a board game manufacturer and publisher. Um, you saw how quickly they could turn around the company to make jigsaw puzzles when, 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 when when the demand was there for it, and what they had to do to hire people who basically operated sewing machines to become jig jig jigsaw operators. So I've got a couple of jigsaws as well. Ireland's writers. I'm sure everybody wants to read this jigsaw, right? 500 pieces. Um, <coughs> so, so, that, so that was something that, that, <coughs> that, 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 that and that's the story of why, why Monopoly made its way into the Parker Brothers uh, uh, collection. It was just a sales success, and it was not. It's not. You know, it certainly wasn't the design of the game that attracted them to acquiring the thing. They just wanted to dominate the American board game industry, and in some cases, the, the British and uh, Western European game industry as well. Um, Clue, on the other hand. Kind of uh, is it, it, it's, it's one of those things that has a very British origin. It starts off as pseudo um, before it came over to the U.S. But I, I think we in, in, in writing we had a couple of examples of how the Parker brothers, Scott Parker initially and then eventually hired people uh, based in London to try to acquire work that had been already patented in, in London and buy the American publishing rights for that. Um, uh, that's that kind of give you an idea of what the board game industry looks like around about the turn of century. Um, prior to that, it's a little bit hard to think of many examples of productized games. There's a lot of, of course, you know, chess boards and playing cards, all these things exist. You might have a design on the back of a playing card or a specific thing on, or the way how King or Queen uh, is illustrated that could be copyrighted. Um, but the games that you could actually play of them were pretty much public domain, right? Folk games, 
data you can just freely share with, with each other. There might have been a couple of examples prior to that, but this is around about the 1900s is where mass production and mass distribution all come into its own. Right? There's no, it's not surprising that this, uh, that, that Parker Brothers was based in Salem uh, because it's a seaport. Even though it wasn't like the best seaport because by then the world was moving the steamship and you needed a deeper harbor like what Boston did, um, you, uh, it still had the means of moving large amounts of merchandise. At least two baskets where it could be transported to other boats and you can kind of the rest of off, off the United States. So um, prior to, um, I just want to give you an, an, uh, uh, an idea of how recent this whole idea of buying a game off the shelf is. You know, we're only talking about the 1900s. Um, and prior to that, you, will, you, might, you might buy a toy. You might buy something that you play a game with, you know, golf clubs or something like that, you know, cricket bat. Uh, but you wouldn't necessarily just buy a whole game with a branded title on it just off the shelf. You know, the jigsaws are, you know, kind of like already a pretty extreme case where this is its own game and it's not really interchangeable with another game with the same title. Uh, because the pieces aren't going to fit exactly right. Um, and, uh, you know, until the 1900s, we didn't necessarily have a situation where people assumed that games could be copyrighted or, 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 or trademarked. Uh, you've got, you know, games were just things that people played, and if you liked it, you got the, uh, you, you got the parts that you needed to play it with, but then you wouldn't uh, necessarily own it. Uh, anyone else could go ahead and, and get the same number of parts or similar parts and basically play the same game. Um, one example of this is uh, something that's not in the reading, but uh, yes, I guess this will be over in London too. So how many of you read Tishy Wells? War of the Worlds, Food of God with Tishy Wells. Do you know that he made a war game? He made a war game for little miniaturized tin soldiers. Uh, it's called Little War, so you can find it on a Project Wittenberg. It's about 24 pages. And uh, the rules are only about six pages long, but uh, so it's a quick read. But the previous 18 pages is his development diary of how the rules were made. And it's actually a really fascinating read because it's his cheap while writing it. It's definitely available. Um, about how he came up, how, how, how he was actually a pacifist. Um, ended up developing a set of war game rules on how you set up troops, how far they could move, how you launch cannon shots at each other. Um, and it was all, all based on this one, uh, li one little toy that you could buy from any toy store. So it wasn't like, you know, here's a box that you will buy with H.G. Wars Little, uh, H.G. Wells Little Wars, uh, you know, on the title. Uh, he just printed it as a pamphlet, basically, 24 pages, it's not huge. Um, and uh, if you got that, you will read a little story by H.G. Wells of how this game came to be, and then write in the back of, of, of it, there'll be six pages of, if you just buy these parts, you can play this game for yourself. So again, you know, he kind of owns the book, but he doesn't really own the game. You, you are expected to find the parts he, yourself. In particular, uh, there was a little breech loader cannon. I think it actually with like a little bit of explosive in it, and then you like a little, little, little cap. And you could use that to fire little wooden projectiles at tin, at tin soldiers and knock them down. And that's how damage was resolved. It was pretty darn cool. So you can do things like terrain. And there are instructions in there on like how you make model terrain. You had to, when you made a building, it had to be completely solid. You could fill it up with blocks, like toy blocks, because you don't want anyone to put big troops inside the building. But you can put them on top of the building. It's pretty cool. Um, but that's, but that, that's something like 1914, 1915. That's already you know past past the date where these products are starting to appear on on on, on the shelf, and it gives you an indication of what it was like before that. Is that people printed out rule books? And you can still find books for card games, for instance, you know, on the shelf, like 101 games you can play with a deck of cards or something like that. But that's how games were shared. You know, they weren't put in a box and you know, trade wrap, twine, tied together with twine or something like that, uh, uh, and. And, 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 and sold as a product. So, um, so today we've got these games. Um, just a just a quick look through uh, so, some more details. By the way, 
<coughs> I want you to take a look at these boxes that I'm going to be handing around and look at the sizes of them. I want you to think about how how you will put this on a store shelf. Right? Target or Walmart. Uh, I guess at that time it would be a dry something box store. Now these are modern boxes, obviously. These are not, you know, these don't date back to the turn of half a century. Because I kind of want to talk about the also kind of the reality of what it's like to be able to sell a product like this in stores today, right? Um, actually, I should have brought in um, like the centers of the time box uh, comparison. But, but this jigsaw box is about the size of, of, of a center of the centers of, of the time box. Um, first thing is orientation, right? <laughs> this is meant to be sort of seen this way or this way, possibly stacked this way. How many of you have gone you know, shopping in a Target or in a Walmart or a Sears or something for gifts in Christmas? Okay, yeah. You're buying it for family members or something? Uh, friends? For yourself? Anyone buy games for yourself at Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, this 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 is important. Uh, you know, you, I, I don't think it's any great surprise that, uh, if I told you that the majority of the prop, or at least a very huge chunk of the profit that a company like Parker Brothers or Hasbro will make will be during the Christmas season, right? But they are not usually bought by the people who are going to play them. They're usually going to be bought as gifts. So. All of this stuff is positioned not to attract you to, to think that, oh, this is something I want to play, but rather this is something that I want someone else to play. Uh, or I think someone else is going to like this. Um, how, how many of you bought Monopoly for a friend? Or, or a brother or a sister, if I remember. Yeah. Did you think it was a good game at the time when you bought it? Yeah. So why, so why did you buy it? Because other people like it, usually. Because or other people It's like a gift. Because, you're, because the person you were buying for might, might, might they were younger. have liked it at one time. Oh, they were younger. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it seemed like it. And maybe you remember liking it when you were at yeah. that age. Yeah. Anyone else? We got it from my grandpa. You, you got one for your grandpa? Then yeah. Had you played with your grandpa before? No. 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 Oh, wow. OK. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so like, like maybe this is an opportunity to play this, this old favorite. But had your grandpa played it before? By the time you I'm it, sure you know? he's old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Game's old. That's right. Who else? I thought I thought I saw some of the hands. Yeah, I mean we play with my cousins at Christmas. I think it's the only time any of us play. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that like the thing that you do with your cousins? Oh, well, when we were younger, because we had such a wide age range. Mm -hmm. We had like, you know, like second or third grade. It's just a, it was a hard, hardcore, ruthless cat, capitalist game for second graders, right? But you know, you, you, you can play it. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, you people have fond memories, not necessarily of the game itself, but of sessions playing Monopoly with families and, 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 and friends. And you think, you know, whether or not the game's any good, you kind of hope that other people will have those fond memories of playing it with friends and family. Maybe even with the person who's giving the game, so you might end up actually playing the box that you that you bought. Um, but that's what all these games are designed to do. These games are, are packaged to be gifts. And so when you look at something like Battleship and Risk and Monopoly and Clue, they're these huge things that you know are going to look good if you wrap it up with a you know with with with, with paper. Um, Pit and Tiddly Wings. That. Uh, Tiddly Wings is hard to make an argument for a much bigger box because you really don't need much of a, a, a lot of space for a Tiddly Wings box. Go ahead and open it actually so you can see what's inside. I bet it's mostly hair. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I, yeah, I think it's probably the box 
Let's see how much of that box is actually occupied by stuff. There is a bell, and that requires a certain depth of box. The rest is foam. <laughs> yeah. So there's a little deck of cards and a bell. And the bell, you know, I, I, I'm not even sure the bell was included in the original version of Kate uh, that was that, that described in, in, in the reading. The deck of cards certainly was. Okay. Is there a cup in there? Yeah. Okay, there actually is a cup in there. Good. Yeah. All right. It's not just a cardboard hole. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, these things are, these boxes are all designed to catch your eye, you know, sitting up on a store shelf like that. I believe the standard shelf is 18 inches. That's, uh, that's, that, um, when Rob came to the class a long time back, he was starting with that. That's, that's like a standard industry width. If, if, if anyone's worked in retail and, and knows that the numbers are slightly different, please tell me. Um, and, um, and it, you know, if you buy, if, 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 if you sell boxes, you know, basically this wide, you can sort of stack them either, you know, on top of each other, and then put one vertically at top. Uh, sorry, uh, put put the one vertically in, in front to show. This is risk, and if you take that box off, then you can see a whole bunch of other risk boxes at the back. Then you can take that. Um, I believe that uh, there is. Like with the candy bands and the shoots and batters, that's kind of an interesting situation where they're a little bit off, so that you uh, uh, and, and both bo both um, they're a little shorter, both in horizontally and vertically, so that you can actually fit three in a row. Um, so you can see candy land, shoots and batters is probably some uh, some third very simple game. If anyone can, can think of one that all fit in a row, and then you just see this like giant wall of Hasbro. Right. That's 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 what they want you to do when you come in. Um, where you where the boxes are placed in the store, whether it's Target or Walmart or some you know, even specialty game stores, is all paid for and sold and has a price. Um, you know um, how much Hasbro pays the retailer for placement determines whether it is the first thing you see when you come into the store or whether the stock that they are keeping in the back room, but you have to ask for it. Uh, you know that's 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 where the smaller pub the, the smaller publishers end up. So maybe though there's one display case somewhere where there's all games, but for the most part, you're not gonna gonna be able to pick up a uh, game off the shelf unless the board game manufacturer themselves is actually paid for that shelf space. And they're gonna make it back, or well, hopefully they're gonna make it back uh, by the end of the se uh, season because that many more pieces are gonna be sold. And it's okay that. They're selling the boxes to people who already own Monopoly. We buy it because they're not buying it for themselves. Buying it for somebody else who also might already have a copy of Monopoly, but no one seems to take that into consideration necessarily when they buy this. Uh, <laughs> how many of you have multiple copies of Monopoly? I have two. Okay, uh, how many? <coughs> Four, maybe? Four? Yeah. 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 Different kinds yeah, of Monopoly? Yeah, they, they all have the different skins. Like there's like Star Wars. On Star Wars. Millennial did on and on. Uh, are those, is it just different kinds? Or? Yeah. I had Star Wars, Nintendo, uh, Nintendo that's Pokemon, yep. and then the original. Yep. I can imagine Pokemon. I'm interested in Nintendo. Uh, so we have Junior. Because I learned to put it up when I was like three years old. Because uh, my dad's a big player. What's the difference? Is it? It's just, everything is just simpler and I also do like that the dollar amounts are one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. Most all these hundreds and stuff. So the ones mm -hmm. don't really matter. Right. You don't have to. You don't have to um, hundred. Yeah, they simplify the rule, but it's basically the same game. Oh. No community chess. Same size. I mean, yeah. same number of spaces at least. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then you said junior too. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, I also have Pokemon, and I also have like electronic ones. Oh, uh, I don't know. If that's, that's kind. Are you talking about like electronic like, devices you carry, or something you load into a computer? Uh. Both. Oh, okay. I have a disc and I have the like a Monopoly thing that's like it's kinda like a Game Boy that only plays Monopoly. Oh okay, I can see. Like LEDs that light up behind you. Those are both folks, the disc you can play against the computer or against another person and the little Game Boy thing you can play against the computer. Cool. So, yeah. I have the new one. Different versions? Yeah. Regular I think red socks. Uh -huh. Um 
I have a rip off of Monopoly that's my town, and so like different like businesses in town back in like 1985, none of them exist anymore, like paid for their business to be each spot on the board. Oh, so it's averaging, basically. Yeah. Um, and I have Junior Monopoly, and I also have Junior Monopoly Dinosaur Thief, which was by far the best. Same, same set of rules, just with dinosaurs. Yeah, except I do think the board was a little bit smaller. I don't think there were quite as many spaces, but it's okay. essentially the same. Okay. So is it best because of dinosaurs, or because it actually is faster to play? Well, it is fast. Like, Junior Monopoly is faster to play, but also because also dinosaurs, right? <laughs> I, I, I have the Singapore version, I think, is very similar to the old, like, local town version. Right? It's just properties of, you know, uh, land spaces. Does anybody know where the original road names came from? Atlantic City. Atlantic City, we just... Um, and that's the version that we've got. Um, the, the version that we've got now is being published by Winning Moves Games, which <clears throat> is kind of like a... Boutique Hasbro subsidiary that sells classic versions of all of these games, um, and so they sell it at a slightly higher price point. I'm not sure if the price tags are still on these things, but you can take a look. But they're more expensive than the versions that you buy in Target. Uh, you know, they have metal pieces. They are for people who are explicitly buying these games for nostalgia value, um, rather than you know the cheapest, most economic, uh, most economical. Um, I'm trying to remember other things that Rob mentioned. Um, every little thing that you'll find inside uh, any one of these boxes costs money. You know, just, just uh, uh, definitely think about that. Scrabble, of course, you have all of the tiles. You have the boards themselves. Um, if you're lucky, there is a nice little piece of uh, cloth tape holding the board together, which means that it's going to last much opening and uh, closing, and it's going to fold up flat. Uh, if you're unlucky, un Lucky is just one giant piece of cardboard that's been folded in half and it's not going to last very long. Um, that's, that's a crease, but it's, it, 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 you know, it's, it, it's just not going to last that long. Risk, of course, has had many different uh, versions with some of them with soldiers and horses, some of them with just numbers. I had a version at home that was played, basically just played with plastic numbers. Uh, uh, there was a designer who came to our, uh, to our lab um, who spoke about Risk. Uh, the, 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 she used to work for Hasbro. And he had a version where instead of soldiers and horses, it was arrows. Um, and so you, you, you move all these arrows and, and, um, as if it was like a war map, you know, and say all these forces are going on. The problem is that the arrows were flat, and you couldn't really pick them up. And besides, they were kind of sharp and pointy, and people kind of could get hurt. Uh, and they not sell. that version did not sell well. Um, there's a good story about why that happened. Um, but um, so. For today, when you actually play these games, um, I'd like you to actually like take a look at all of these pieces. As a fun little exercise, you might want to try to estimate how much each piece actually costs and just add up what the manufacturing cost of this box might, might have been. Um, I don't know if anybody here is from mechanical engineering or uh, any kind of manufacturing. Uh, actually, Han, you, 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 you know something about plastic manufacturing, right? Yeah. yeah. Not so, injection molding, but yeah. So, so, so you might, uh, you know, it might just be a fun exercise versus, you know, like a deck of cards. And um, yeah, I'd also recommend reading the rules, mm -hmm. actually trying to play the way the rules say. Yeah. Maybe the home, the home rules you might remember when you played it as a kid, just to see how they're presenting this game. How are they presenting the rules to? Somebody just got this as a gift, and they're going to try to figure out how to play this thing. Yeah, see if they've improved the rules ever since, right? You know, I'm actually curious about the classic version of Monopoly, whether it's the old, the original set of rules, or whether it's some sort of updated uh, printout. Uh, yeah, see how they describe the Scrabble game. Does this one have a bag? Yeah, no bag. Oops. Oh, wooden pieces. Um, you know, it's got a little bag, and think about how that makes things easy to randomize. Um, and yeah, and if you've played these games before, and I think many of you have, uh, definitely go into it by reading the rules first, so that you're not just playing the same, you know, uh, the way that, that you remember, and also try out some of the other games. Okay. Cool. Let's talk a little bit about the games.
Um, so, okay, so I think everyone got a chance to play uh, Sorai. The, the jigsaw puzzle game is still going on. Um, so, let's talk about the pieces. Let's talk about the things that you're, that you're moving around. I mean, how, how, how many of you feel that the pieces that you're playing with are like, significantly different from pieces that you remember playing with? No? Yeah? Pretend on the board is Oh yeah, yeah, okay. So the board design was like it's kind of insane. Uh, it's, it's it's really scary. And I remember it being a little candy thing about each square. Right. <laughs> it's essentially like this. It's like It's like a here's Wally. It's, it's like a where's Wally kind of thing. <laughs> but the actual cards weren't all that different, right? No, I remember the I remember the game being each space like a different piece of candy. Right. Yeah. Now each space is in a color. Oh okay. That's how I remember. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Like colors or candy? Okay, colors. Hands up. All right. Different pieces of candy. Okay. Well, he. he oh. Well, the thing there is that every piece, every space, but there were a there number of like every other space had some kind of image on it. Yeah. I think it still has images. the. I think it still has the the the, so the like occasional candy, on it. candy. Yeah. The thing is that if every piece was a different kind of candy, it'd probably be more colorblind friendly, right? Because you'd be able to actually just see the kind of candy even if you couldn't tell the colors. It's not very colorblind this, this is This is just not friendly with anyone who has eyes, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's just the visual design of the board. The actual spacing of the board is not all that different. Um, yeah, so... so you know, you, you, you've had a hand, the, the, the chance to pick up the pieces, slam on the, on the bell on pin and stuff like that. Um, you know, what, like, some, some of these pieces, like in Clue, have a lot of money put into some parts that aren't actually all that useful, right? Like the, um, like the, 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 the knife and the lead pipe and things like that. These are, was that solid metal? Yeah, what those yeah. pieces? Yeah. Those were like solid metal pieces. And it's a sharp knife. Okay. So, so, I, so, because in in assignment two you're thinking about aesthetics, you know, what do you think about the choices of the materials that they use for the various parts of the games, of of the games that you played today or that you saw played today? Uh, well, yeah. One thing that bothered me with Clue, mm -hmm. if you committed a murder, or if you no, if someone committed a murder and you find a body. You're going to know whether they were murdered with a knife or a pipe. They don't look the same. <laughs> <laughs> or a gun. Mm -hmm. Maybe they also were a person in Mr. Bond. Yeah. Who? <laughs> <laughs> a very astute mother. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, that there's there is a problem. I mean, I I I I played a version of Clue where the body's down a dark staircase, so you can't actually see what's at the bottom. You know, it's kind of you only see the outline. Um, so I think that was kind of the visual explanation for that. But you're right, you know, it's kind of, it's, 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 it's not a very good justification. Although, if people remember the movie, right, he's kind of like stabbed by everything, right? He, he's hit by a lead pipe and stabbed by, 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 <laughs> by a dagger. So the question is, which is first? Yeah, which one act, what was the first blow? Does, doesn't matter what, what hit him after he died. <laughs> how, how about for risk? You've got the... You've, what, you, you've got horses, people, and cannon? Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I always found it difficult to remember which was which. Like, which, what was what value. I seem to recall that the pieces were, like, relatively bigger. So, I mean, like, I remember the cannon being at least as big as the cavalry, maybe larger. Mm -hmm. And that's like, oh, that's worth more than the cavalry. It's just worth more than the photo guy. The pieces could just have been shrunk due to cost. Um, yeah. It's possible. I remember bigger pieces too, but we had that that conversation, and maybe we were we were smaller, so the pieces looked bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Our pieces were also Roman numerals. Uh, yep. Uh, but I, I remember seeing people who had that that that, that type of pieces and, and viewing them because all I had were freaking Roman numerals, but they were easy to count at least. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so for the rest of today, you've pretty much got time to work on your um, in your teams. You've got uh, feel feel free to continue playing, uh, finishing up your games. The the uh, prototyping materials are all up here. Feel free to come up and grab what what you need. Uh, Rick or I will be in a room at any given time, so uh, you can come up and ask us questions. Um, but use this time to be able to meet up with your teams. All right. Sorry. Yeah, and if you want us to play your game, we can't. But we're in class play test on Wednesday.
Right on this this Wednesday? Wednesday? Um, I have to schedule here. Yeah. One sec. Uh, let's see, March 12th. Yes, we do in fact have a playtest this uh, this uh, Wednesday. So make sure your games are ready. Um, make make sure you have a draft of your rules so that you can test whether people actually understand your rules. Okay? On Wednesday.